The story of Afghanistan is in so many ways a very tragic one. It is a nation that has suffered invasion, external pressure and internal upheaval since before the time of Alexander the Great. Its people have endured more than their share of hardships. In fact, for many Afghans, all that has changed in the last 1,000 years are the weapons which have been used against so many of them. And among all the people that make up the Afghan nation, probably no other ethnic group has been subjected to the discrimination and violence suffered by the Shia Hazara community. They have been deprived of their traditional lands. They've been massacred, sold as slaves, and been denied access to the same services and opportunities available to the majority of the population. There is much about the history of Afghanistan and in particular the history and identity of the Hazara that remains unrevealed and unknown to this day. This is the story of their journey across the centuries. Historically, Afghanistan has been the link between Central Asia, the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent. And so it's a nation made up of many different ethnic groups. The result of innumerable invasions and migrations. Within its current borders, there are at least a dozen major ethnic groups, including Turkmen, Hazara, Pashtun, Tajik and Uzbek. The Pashtun nationality has always been the most dominant and the royal families of the country were always Pashtun. Today, they represent about 50% of the total population. Islam was brought to Afghanistan during the 8th and 9th centuries by the Arabs. Prior to that, the nation had been ruled by various Persian, Greek and Central Asian empires. Following a subsequent breakdown in Arab rule, semi-independent states began to form. The Mongolian invasions of the 13th century came as massive black clouds driven by divine winds over a desolate landscape. Local dynasties and states were overwhelmed and crushed by the mighty armies led by the legendary Genghis Khan and his successors. These ruthless conquerors were to remain in control of part or all of the country until the 1500s, despite much resistance and internal strife. Following the collapse of Mongol rule, Afghanistan found itself in a situation much like today, caught in the grip of great powers. Armies marched to and fro, devastating the land and murdering the people, laying siege to city after city and destroying whatever had been left by the invading armies. It was not until 1747 that Afghanistan was able to free itself. This was the year that Nadir Shah, an empire builder from Persia, died and left a vacuum in Central Asia. Ahmed Shah, a former Afghan bodyguard, took up his post. Ahmed Shah was a Pashtun and his Pashtun clan was to rule Afghanistan in one form or another for the next 200 years. Ahmed Shah was able to unify the different Afghan tribes and went on to conquer considerable parts of what are today eastern Iran, Pakistan, northern India and Uzbekistan. His successors though proved unable to hold his vast empire together and within 50 years much of it had been seized by, by rival regional powers. 
Within the country, there were numerous bloody civil wars for the throne, and for many Afghans, it meant little that their lives were now being uprooted and destroyed by their own people, as opposed to foreign invaders. At the beginning of the 19th century, Afghanistan's internal affairs became dramatically aggravated by the increasing intervention of two new foreign powers, the British Empire and Tsarist Russia. These two great powers were engaged in a race for Afghanistan. Their seizures of land, the overthrow of indigenous nations and their reckless interference in the affairs of the remaining independent states in the region became known as the Great Game. For Afghans, the consequences were devastating. The arrival of European imperialism into the region simply accelerated and made more deadly the wars, poverty and destruction that had already racked the region. The Pashtun kings reigned over the country until 1973 when a republic was declared, but this new political regime also failed to meet the fundamental needs and aspirations of the people. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979 marked the beginning of 25 years of suffering and continual strife that transformed the country into a desolate land once again. The rich cultural heritage of this country also began to disappear gradually, as did the Afghan people's hopes of recovering some sort of life, a decent income and a reasonably secure existence. These are the mountainous central highlands of Afghanistan, the Hazara Jat, or the land of the Hazara. And just like these imposing landscapes, the history of the Hazara people is shrouded in mystery. The Hazara's gentle Mongolian features set them apart from other Afghans. They speak an archaic form of Persian, with words borrowed from Mongol and Turkish. According to popular belief, the Hazara are descendants of the Mongol hordes that invaded this region in the 13th century. It's thought that when Genghis Khan retreated from the lands of the ancient Bactria, he left behind 1,000 of his men in the mountains of the Hazara Jat. These people later came to be known as Hazara, in reference to the Persian word Hezar, which means 1,000. But there has been much debate in academic circles about this legend. The early inhabitants of these regions were Buddhists, but when Ali, the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, arrived here with his companions, some Hazara tribes converted to Shia Islam during their stay and over a long period of time after him. In those days, being a Shiite simply meant declaring allegiance to Ali and his family. But over the centuries, the various Muslim communities and clans became more radicalized as they began stressing the importance of tradition and identity in order to underline the differences between Shia and Sunni Islam which has always been the dominant force in the Islamic world.
Until their land was captured by the Pashtuns in the 1880s, the Hazara placed women on an equal footing with men. The social position of women was such that they were consulted on family decisions and might even ride to war with the men. This, of course, is not at all what one encounters in rural Afghan society today. Over the centuries, successive invasions forced the Hazara to retreat deeper into the mountainous regions of the Hazara Jat. In these inhospitable lands, they managed just about to scrape a living. They cultivated the land and made utensils in wood and metal. They became expert ironmongers and manufactured swords and shields, but they also produced spades for working the land. They remained independent of non-Hazara ethnic control until 1892. But the Afghan ruler Abdul Rahman put an end to all of that. Abdul Rahman came to power in 1880 as the Emir of Kabul. Initially, his pressure against the Hazara was political and financial. But in the face of their resistance, he resorted to oppression and violence. And this led to uprisings by the local populations. Abdul Rahman defeated the Hazara tribes one by one. He occupied the entire Hazarajat and incorporated it into the Afghan state in 1893. He replaced local leaders with Pashtun administrators who set up a system of exorbitant taxes. His troops assaulted Hazara women, organized the pillaging of homes, the enslavement of children. By sending Sunni clerics to every village in Hazara Jat, Abdul Rahman forced the Shiite Hazara to attend Sunni mosques and to abandon Shiism. Hazara resistance to Abdul Rahman's integration was ruthlessly crushed and an edict was issued granting rights over the fertile pasture lands in the region to Pashtun nomad tribes, the Kochis, who had helped the Emir to conquer the area. For 90 years, the Kochis exercised these rights. When they themselves became landlords, they built the mud fortresses now in ruins that still dot the Hazarajat countryside. Meanwhile, Abdul Rahman partitioned their lands into three provinces to destroy the Hazara's sense of unity and independence. He described the Shiites as infidels. This is a translation of a letter he addressed to Sunni clerics and preachers in 1892. Let it be known to all respectable mullahs and preachers authorized to say prayers in mosques that the infidels, namely the Shiites, are also living in Afghanistan. At the instigation of those devils, their imams, they thought it fit to abuse the caliphs. If their infidelity is due to their ignorance, they ought to grasp the true facts of a true religion. But if they persist in their false faith, they should all be put to death and their property confiscated in accordance with the divine doctrine and the precepts of the prophet. This was the beginning of a century of bloody persecution. Mishaa 
یک جامعه انسانی از هم پاشید. The kings who succeeded Abdul Rahman did not subject the Hazara to such cruelty. At one point during his reign, Habibullah Khan, the elder son of Abdul Rahman, addressed a letter to the Asara, acknowledging the atrocities committed by his father against them. In this letter, which has been kept by a Hazara family through generations, he asks them to return to the lands that have been confiscated and illegally granted to the Kochis, the very people who had helped his father in brutally suppressing them. But the Hazara still felt like strangers in their own lands, although their feuds with warlords in the region were in no way comparable to the ethnic massacres of the past. They lived a precarious existence and yet gradually began building a new economy on a small scale. But their terrible ordeal would not be over yet. Nineteen ninety four. The country is ruled by warring Mujahideen factions, squabbling over the pitiful remains of a country they themselves freed from ten years of Soviet occupation. It was at about this time that the world first became aware of the Taliban, when they were appointed by Islamabad to protect a convoy trying to open up a trade route between Pakistan and Central Asia. They proved effective bodyguards, driving off other Mujahideen groups who attacked and looted the convoy. They went on to take the city of Kandahar, beginning a remarkable advance that led to their capture of the capital, Kabul, in September 1996. Many Afghans, weary of conflict and anarchy, were relieved to see corrupt and often brutal warlords replaced by the devout Taliban, who had some success in eliminating corruption, restoring peace and allowing trade to resume. But unfortunately for the Afghan people, their rule marked the beginning of one of the darkest and most tragic periods of recent Afghan history. The Taliban, under the direction of the shadowy and secretive Mullah Muhammad Omar, instituted a reign of terror through the highly strict interpretation of Islamic law, or Sharia. For the Hazara, history was repeating itself, and a new tragic chapter would echo the horror of the reign of King Abdul Rahman. religious edict, which word for word is practically the same as the fatwa issued by Abdul Rahman, the Taliban authorities issued their instructions. Shias are infidels. There is no doubt in their infidelity. Boycotting Shias is the duty of every devotee of the Prophet. We demand that Shias should be declared a non-Muslim minority on the basis of their infidel beliefs and their entry into Mecca and Medina should be banned. After having been forced out of their lands, the Hazara sought refuge in the rugged mountainous areas of northern Afghanistan. There they hoped to find land that would allow them to live a peaceful existence and to practice their religious faith freely. Mazari Sharif, the capital of Balkh province, owes its name to the mausoleum in which Imam Ali, the Prophet Muhammad's cousin, is supposedly buried. According to popular belief, a 12th century local mullah had a dream in which Ali was secretly buried in a locality near the ancient city of Balkh. After some investigations, the then Sultan ordered a mosque to be built on the designated spot, but this was later destroyed. Today, the mausoleum remains an inevitable place of pilgrimage for all Muslims, Shia and Sunni. Even at the height of fighting between rival Mujahideen factions, when the whole country was torn apart, Mazare Sharif remained an island of peace for the Hazara, the Tajiks and the Uzbeks who lived there.
But in 1997, when the Taliban were preparing to take the city, the local population took drastic action. Over 2,000 Taliban were killed in the ensuing violence. Things didn't end there, though. The Taliban wanted revenge. In a concerted attack in August 1998, they savagely slaughtered the mostly Hazara population during a six-day frenzy that cost the lives of thousands of civilians. other than the massacres they carried out the Taliban also obliterated everything that made up the identity of the Hazara among other symbols, they destroyed the mausoleum built in the memory of Abdul Ali Mazari. This political figure was considered by the Hazara as their spiritual father. He founded the Hezb el Wadat or Unity Party, and was the first political leader to speak up for and on behalf of a unified Hazara and Shiite political party, putting their case to the UN and the international community. Mazari's faithful secretary and bodyguard, who was also killed, is buried alongside him. The Hazara have begun to rebuild what the Taliban took away from them, but the way they live today and their current poverty bear the scars of past violence and testify to their sacrifices. Using religious heresy as a pretext, the Taliban brutally punished all those they called parasites, foreigners in their own lands. They spared no one, they showed no pity, not even towards the most vulnerable and the weakest. Yet, as often happens throughout history, there were a courageous few who dared. Among them, this young woman. The memories of those terrible times are still very much alive. پدرم برادرایم در شهر بودن مصروف کار خود سرصدا بلند شد فهمیدیم که وضعیت به هم خورده باید در که درگوشی از خدا بگیره وقت رزی که اعتمال ایراکت و مشک چیزی بود من خوار و برادرای کچه که در زیر زمینی بردم خودم دم در کچه منتظر بودم تا برادرم یا پدرم بیاین اگالت نارامی به من دست بود وقتی در روزی کچه را باز کردم دیدم تعداد زیاد از مردم اکثریتش از ملیت ازاره از منطقه شمال طرف ما که بنام نور خدا نای نوم شهر مزار است برامده بودن اطفال، زن و پیر، جوان کس در دستش توشک، بالشت، کس در دستش خورا کباب طرف شهر می آمدن می گفتن ما روزی شریف میریم زیارت ازرات علی میریم اونجا می خواهیم هم تر از اینجا سونجا باش در بین ازی مردم محدود طفل کوچه که دیدم دو بسر بچه که سن یکش چهار سال بود سن دیگه شم هفت و هشت سال 
ایدو تو طفل خورد گریه میکرد امی مردم که امرایش بود سنی یکی از خانمای که چادری داشت صدا میکرد خاله فکر کردم شاید مادرش خواهرش کسی باشه برش دشنام داد گفت از ما دور شد نمیخواستی طفل امرایش بره متاثر شدم چون طفل خورده بود کدک بود نیازمندی داشت ضرورتش بود که امول ازه کسی باید رای مایه میکرد صدا کردم برش گفتم بیا طرف ما اردیشانه و دهلیز خانه بردم بعد از گفتم که دزیر زمینی بره چون وضعیت خوب نیست صدا بلندتر شد مر مادرم گفت که بدم رای خود نگاه نکنم طفله را از میلیت از آره است نمیگه میفهمد که طالب اگر بیاین اولین بار با می مردم هر بر خورده که میکنم با می نمیکنم برشون گفتم فرق نمیگه قرار باشه اگر ما بمیریم اگر خداوند خواسته باشه می دو طفله خورد باعث میشه شاید ما از بین بریم اما اگر زنده هم بانیم شاید می دو طفله خورد حال اینا چی گناه دارن وقت صبح شد برش نان دادم و یک دو ساعت گذشت گفت نه ما را خانه ببرین مادرم جگر خود میشه یک برادرم از خودم خورد است هر دو طفله گرفت هم برای خود برد تا یک فاصله برده بودش تا نزدیک خانه بی به دو زدگه ندانست بچه ها کجا شدن مادرشان آمد یا نامد ندانست اما مثل یک خاطر هم همیش همیش در زندگی من به یاد مانده وارستی بسیار زیاد تاثیر هم کرد Now that Mazar-e-Sharif had fallen, there was one last obstacle to complete Taliban rule over the whole of Afghanistan and to establish their supremacy. In the rugged mountains of Hazarajat, each passing season brings hardship for the villagers who live here. The endless succession of high mountain peaks obscures the possibility of more welcoming lands beyond. Yet, when least expected, the road suddenly opens up and gives way to a 2,000-year-old site, a treasure trove of history and architecture. Bamiyan. Situated on the ancient Silk Route, it was an important crossroads between East and West, where all the trade between China and the Middle East passed. This town is the cultural center of the Hazara. It was the site of several Buddhist and Hindu monasteries and a thriving center for religion, philosophy and art. Monks at the monasteries lived as hermits in small caves carved into the side of the Bamiyan cliffs. Dominating the valley, two monumental statues of standing Buddhas carved into the side of a cliff, measuring 55 and 38 meters. They testify to the greatness of Bamiyan's cultural and religious history. Buddhist monks embellished their caves with religious statues and elaborate brightly colored frescoes. But over the years, these deteriorated. Under pressure from the various local warlords, the poor of Bamiyan removed paintings and other artifacts on order. These were then exported and sold mainly to neighboring Pakistan. At one point, local clerics declared the Buddhas offensive to Islam. The result was that the head of the small Buddha statue, situated midway between the two large ones, was chiseled away. All these acts of iconoclasm provided some income to the very poor in Bamiyan, but above all they served to fill the coffers of local warlords and other clan chiefs. But despite these acts of aggression, for centuries, the Buddha statues continued to fascinate scholars, historians, and the general public from all over the world. Apart from its gigantic proportions, the large Buddha had one feature that drew the attention of the onlooker immediately. It had no face. Could this be the work of early Muslim iconoclasts? But the clear
clean way in which the face has been cut out suggests that it was actually built in this manner for a very particular purpose. An eminent Afghan archaeologist working and teaching at the University of Strasbourg in France has been studying this mystery for a very long time. The real face of Buddha was a euh, mask in euh, wood qui pivotait sur le visage au niveau de rigole que je vous ai montré, euh, qui était couvert de feuilles d'or ou de, de tôle en or. Il y a un chroniqueur musulman, que ma, mes études n'est pas encore terminées, dit « ses yeux de rubis, rubis scintillaient la nuit ». Ça veut dire que c'était rubis ou un ver, grand verre de couleur rouge. Pour que ça scintille la nuit, il faut mettre de la lumière derrière. La Bouddha de Bamiyan était quelque chose comme ça, et ce n'était pas l'œuvre des iconoclastes, ça a été fait pour impressionner le, le monde entier. Winter 2001. With the cold and snow, the pace of life of the people of Bamiyan has slowed down. At dusk, they huddle back to their humble homes and wait patiently for the bitter, cold northerly winds to subside. The Taliban finally arrived in Bamiyan, but not before having massacred some 300 Hazara people on the way. At that time, they had laid claim to over 80% of Afghanistan, but their sovereignty was recognized by only three countries, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The people of Bamiyan resisted valiantly, but the intruders were far too powerful. <laughs> روی مقامات طلبی خیلی سنگین بود مقامات هم از این از نگاه نظامی شکست قبل شکست نبود اگه اکثرش روی اختلافات بود اختلاف داخلی منطق بودن باید شکست مردن تکنده نظامی با همو فنگ داشتن مرمی اندک داشتن با همو مقامات میکنم خیلی وقت داشته که بانان خوش خانه بوده وقت بانان خوش برسه نیاز نداشت دیگه گشت برسه مثلا چیز دیگه برسه با بانان خوش که نیرو نظام مقامات میکرد محاصره ای که با امیان کامل محاصره بود کلا نظر جار محاصره اقتصادی بوده این تر مردم بسیار شکنده بوده از این مزار شریف فور یرز ارلیه the Taliban again committed acts of barbarism never witnessed in these parts since the 19th century they burned down mosques and sent out their infantry on a mission to smoke out Shiite clerics whom they accused of heresy their objective was ethnic cleansing. Nothing less would do. Over 700 people were killed, and those who could escape packed all their possessions and headed for the mountains. And yet, there are so few differences in the daily practice of Islam between Sunnis, who are followers of the Caliphs, and Shias, who declare their loyalty to Ali. <laughs> مردم هلمن اینجا آمده بود در مدرسه مهدی هم اونجا درس می دادم او به عنوان طالب جنگی آمده بود اینجا اتاقای ما یک جا بود او آدم گریه می کرد یک زمی پشتنا بود می گفت ما را از اونجا روان کرده که برین با کافرا بی جنگی ما شما را می بینیم نماز می خانید ما شما را می بینیم قرآن می خانید ما شما را می بینیم جماعت می خانید فقط فرق ما این است که شما دست خودی قسمی می گیریم ما دست خودی قسمی می گیریم ما چرا شما را بکشیم؟ اونا رو فهمانده بودن که این مردم قسمی ها ظلم به اندازه به حقی مردم روا داشتن خانه های مردم سختاندن قرآن ها رو سختاندن کتاب خانه ها رو سختاندن کتاب خانه ای جامعه ای داشتن در امی مرکز بامیان اون رو آتیش زدن در بین او قرآن بود مفاتح بود همه ایشون رو سختاندن می گفت قرآن از هزاره هاست این قدر منطق نداشتن که قرآن ببینه که این قرآن از راه ها فرق داره یا نه in the name of faith, the tragic wars of religion between Sunnis and Shias have continued uninterrupted since the 7th century. Beyond ethnic massacres and clan warfare, the ignorance of these new invaders has forced the vanquished people into an abyss filled with the suffering of the past.
It was ignorance again that prompted the Taliban to commit a shocking and irretrievable act. One fine day in March 2001, an astounded world community was confronted with the fact that the 2,000-year-old Buddhas had gone forever. It took the Taliban over 20 days to destroy the colossal statues. First, they used cannon fire from a row of tanks facing the cliff. Then, they resorted to high explosives, including napalm bombs. They succeeded only after bringing in demolition experts from abroad. Among the prisoners taken by the Taliban was this man. He was forced to work for them in a chain gang. For fear of retaliation by Taliban sympathizers, he prefers to remain anonymous. <laughs> Some might think the Taliban were again motivated by religious belief, but not this time. The people of Bamiyan had stopped practicing Buddhism for centuries. The motives are much more complex and lie elsewhere. When a delegation of experts from UNESCO arrived in 2001, the Taliban had seemed to agree with them and to accept not to damage the statues. Yet three days later, they began their demolition work. Many questions remain unanswered and controversy surrounds the role played by certain international organizations and even states with vested interests in the fate of the statues and the future status of Afghanistan. در پوشش یک موضوع اعتقادی یک حرک یک خیانت تاریخی و سیاسی را انجام دادند آنچه طالبان میگفتند ما بت شکنی میکنیم این یک پوشه بود به خاطر که اسلام چندین بار در بامیان مسلط شده هیچگاه بت‌های بامیان لشکرهای اسلامی منفجر نکرده و در لابلای از این کار میخواستند که اول مدنیت کهن افغانستان از بین ببرند و دیوم حضور مدنی و قدیمی و تاریخی مردم هزاره را در اینجا ضربه بزنه چون بامیان بسیار با گذشته های تاریخی حضور و جایگاه مردم ما و نجاد ما بوده و سیومش هم بامیان تنها ولایتی است که جز جاذبه های توریستی آیدات تولیدات دیگر ندارن the Taliban destroyed practically everything on their murderous rampage across Hazarajat. People lost their livelihoods, their homes, 
their cultural heritage. But their supposed liberators, who had promised them a better future, would only rekindle old hatreds and drive a wedge between ethnic groups. Instead of helping people rebuild their broken lives, they set fire to Bamiyan and pillaged the remains of a rich history. The Hazara today have no inkling of the cultural wealth their ancestors had built, yet they will have to learn the ways of hope again, to find their roots and recover their identity and their pride, to attain the peace they have been longing for through the year. Even today, some people still live in caves carved out of the cliffs or in remote villages with no water, electricity or heating. Whole families live in one room where they cook, sleep and eat. The precarious situation of the Hazara of Bamiyan and other regions does not seem to be improving. in order to allow Bamiyan to recover its status as a major historical center, and in a drive to improve its economic situation, a number of projects taking into account the town's Buddhist past are being studied. According to Huang Zhang, a 7th century Chinese Buddhist monk who had taken the Silk Route to reach these regions, a gigantic reclining Buddha measuring 300 meters is buried under the ruins of an ancient sanctuary, situated some distance to the east where the large standing Buddha once stood. For Professor Tazi of Strasbourg University, there's no doubt as to the veracity of this document. For years now, he's returned to Bamayan each spring in order to resume his search. Another major project concerns the large standing Buddha itself. An Afghan sculptor has proposed to rebuild this statue using the same material from the cliff face that was used by the original builders. I make a foundation, strong foundation. I make uh, like a wall in concrete with, uh, with steel. On the top of that, we make bricks. I mean, break the bricks with a special brick with the holes, and we build on the top the shape, the form of the the sculpture. When it's finished, we use the same. Um, uh, uh, material and put them like a uh, uh, modeling on the top which originally made like that if you see I'm trying to use the same old technique there are those who've proposed that the statues not be rebuilt precisely so that new generations might realize just what religious bigotry can lead to they suggest that the empty hollows be left as a reminder of those dark years when ignorance could annihilate the cultural roots of an entire population. The third project seems a compromise between ethics and economics. A Japanese artist has proposed a high-tech laser beam spectacle that would resurrect the fallen Buddhas. 
For four hours each day after nightfall, powerful laser beams would project a three-dimensional image of the Buddhas in their respective places on the cliff face. This would attract people from all over and contribute to the economic recovery of the town. For the governor of the province, the most important issue is for the people of Bamiyan to live in dignity. In the history of Afghanistan, the governor is the first woman to have won this post. She aims to put a stop to the discriminatory measures aimed at the Hazara community in general and at women in particular. She's managed to assert her authority and is moving forward energetically. This is my wish and desire to, to preserve this uh, original culture. And with the help of some young generation, uh, I was able to, to make an uh, um, association. This uh, um, uh, ca association can work with the people to raise their awareness about the cultural heritage and the, not only the cultural heritage, but the common culture, for example, their custom, their tradition, and so on. Hazara music is an age-old tradition that has always carried within it the promise of better days to come. But throughout history, it has lacked respect and sometimes has been rejected. Today, it's thriving again. Accompanied by the traditional tambour, this young musician, in an epic poem about Afghanistan, recounts the wars and misfortunes that his people have had to face in the past, and also their dreams. و همچنین آهنگای محلی هم خودش به نوبی خود پیام داره و این بیانگر ازی است که این مردم اصالت بسیار قدیمی فرهنگی داره و از قدیم مردم اینی می توی فرهنگ داشته بود. In time, the Hazara people may yet regain their position within Afghan society. But the road is a very long one. A stagnant economy and a depressed social climate combined with endemic corruption certainly won't encourage progress. Add to this the ominous re-emergence of the Taliban with their unpunished crimes, poor educational facilities and the slow advance in the field of human rights. But even so, changes are slowly taking place. More and more small associations are being created all over the country with the aim of providing the younger generation with ways to pull themselves out of poverty and deadly ethnic struggles to try and build something out of the ruins of their country. Another tangible sign of that slow transformation is the ever-growing presence of women in Afghan society. Ministers, company bosses, journalists and activists are gradually filling up posts that were until now reserved exclusively for men. Within the last five years, a number of women have managed to speak, write and act in a way that would have meant certain death under the Taliban. This former doctor turned political activist more than anyone is aware of the difficulties that lie ahead before the Afghan government is compelled to recognize its responsibilities in the face of discrimination and injustice. We hope and we struggle for more women's participation in different fields in politics and social affairs which is education and health and other social services and also on, on culture and in every possible way. I don't believe on democracy without women. It does require time and a lot of effort and, and a lot of reform of social behavior to put qualification as a top priority than only the ethnicity and language and religion. The job in Afghanistan is not complete. 
When we talk of democracy, let's make democracy real for the public. Not only by doing fraud on the election or showing in the media that it's done. Uh, try to be more to respect more the human dignity, really, and the human desire. In human security. After a century of unrelenting persecution, the Hazara's sense of bitterness is certainly justified. But what is more striking is their determination to reveal their roots and show how intimately they're intertwined with the rich heritage of Afghanistan. From prehistoric times right up to the present, thousands of objects testifying to the greatness of the Persian, Buddhist and Islamic eras have been removed and smuggled out of the country. In this way, unscrupulous warlords continue to deprive Afghans every day of their cultural and spiritual heritage. Once they realize how closely education and hope are linked, Afghan leaders may decide to stop funneling their resources exclusively into fighting against scourges that seem to be beyond them, that can play into the hands of other powers who profit by them and conceal the growing corruption at all levels. Granting ethnic groups what is rightfully theirs, uniting rather than dividing, acknowledging the past, rather than sacrificing it. These all need to become priorities. Understanding the need to be humane is possibly the best way to guarantee a future for these humble mountain people. If the countless men and women who are striving to make a better future for Afghanistan decide to make this a priority, it might prove enough to keep the flame burning. It just might.